Lecture number 12, May 10, 1958. Now, last time, we talked about the various elements which I loosely put under the category of style, because they're all specific techni technical problems that come up in writing or in wording. Uh, and we uh, covered just two, as you remember, exposition and flashbacks. Uh, now, the next uh, topic I want to take up is transitions. We think, uh, we talked about uh, transitions in relation to flashback. Well, uh, you will find that there is another problem in all writing which is very tricky. It's the kind of problem that you usually do not quite visualize until you come up against it in a story. And that is how to take your action from one point to another or how to make bridges between developments. One of the difficult technical things uh, in which an amateur usually will show that he is an amateur is, for instance, uh, how to take a person out of a room and down the stairs to the street, or uh, have someone cross the room and pick up something on the other side. It's those small technical things, the kind of things which on the stage in a play are taken care of unobtrusively by the director who has to plan all those movements so that they will be unobtrusive. In writing a novel, they become your responsibility and sometimes they're very difficult. Uh, you have to remember when you write a scene to preserve the plausibility that is the reality of the setting. If, for instance, you have said that uh, some document that the heroine needs is at the other end of the room, and now and she's at this end, and you have to, during a dramatic action, uh, have her go across the room and pick up the document, you'll find that if you don't mention that she walked across the room, there will be a bad uh, inconsistency in the scene. If you have planned it in the description that she's, let us say, by the fireplace to the left, and the document needs this on a table to the right, and if you're writing a scene which is stationary by the fireplace, but then she has to see that document, if you don't mention that she went across the room, that will be an inconsistency which your readers will notice. But if you do mention it, sometimes, uh, it will be a very bad interruption of the mood and the purpose of the scene you're writing, and you have to know how to do it. The principle there is the same as what a director does on the stage. If you ever watch for directorial touches, you will notice that the director has his characters moving at the right moment, in a way which is not obtrusive. He has the, uh, all the movements of a scene calculated. And you have to do the same in effect. But the way to do it, when you don't want to interrupt an important or emotional scene by a technical reminder of that kind, such as the, the heroine has to cross the room, the way to do it unobtrusively is always, in effect, to think outside the square. Don't limit yourself to just the dry assignment, like stage direction of saying she crosses to the table. Tied to the scene you're writing, that, for instance, instead of saying she rushed across the room and sees the documents, uh, say something like, I'm only improvising now, uh, her dress uh, swished with the speed of her steps as she rushed across the room and seized the document. You see, then you, uh, the purpose of this uh, sentence appears to be the description of the movement and might tie in with the emotional violence of the scene or whichever the mood is. But you have covered the point that you had to take her to the other side of the room. In other words, when you need uh, a stage indication or a technical information of that kind, always tied to some element of the scene, whether it's the mood uh, or 
the description of the motion, or any element other than the dry technical reminder, uh, which is the same principle as, as I pointed out to you about exposition. To do exposition uh, skillfully, you always bring it in when your focus is on something else pertaining to the immediate scene. You do the same thing with transitions. Another example, for instance, uh, you have a scene played in the house, and then you have to take the heroine outside. Now you need uh, to give the audience some sense of transition, and yet you don't want to describe her going in the elevator or going down the stairs unless it's part of some action in the story. Well, this is a trick which you probably noticed in Atlas Shrug. What you do then is you start the next paragraph with, there was a cold wind outside in the street or the street looked lonely and deserted as she emerged from the house. Uh, the example specifically I can think of here is in, right in chapter one of Atlas. Do you remember when Dagny awakens and she has fallen asleep on the train and she asks some passenger how long have been staying and then she leaps to her feet and the passenger watches her running out. Now, rather than say, she jumped to the ground or she ran down the steps. I switch viewpoint in the sense of the next sentence is there was a cold wind rustling among the weeds uh, outside. She ran down the line of the cars. Now you see she's out already. I didn't have to take the time to cover the technical steps of opening a door or, or rushing down the stairs, which was not necessary in this case. It's in this sense that I say, uh, think outside the square. Think, uh, do not focus on just the awkward part of the technical transition, but think of what connection in the next thing or the next setting to which you have to lead, what elements there you can focus on and then bring mm -hmm. your character back by that means. There are many other uh, devices of that kind, but the principle is always the same. Uh, I call it, don't let your seams show. Whenever you have transitions, uh, you cover the seams by means of connecting them to some other aspect which is worth mentioning or is pertinent, and in the process of doing that, you've covered the technical method. Uh, now, this is uh, about all that's important about the issue of transitions. There are as many ways of doing it as you'll have problems, but whenever some passage seems awkward to you, try to think of some indirect way of covering the same thing. However, don't make it so indirect that the seams will show more than ever. That is, it will be awkward and forced. Now, the next subject I want to mention is the issue of metaphors and connotations. Now, you know what metaphors are, metaphors or comparisons. And uh, the very important thing to grasp is the purpose of any kind of comparison. Uh, the purpose in writing is strictly epistemological. There's an important epistemological principle involved. For instance, let us say that I'm describing a spread of snow, and I'll say the snow was white as uh, sugar or white like sugar, grammatically. Uh, now that is a, a kind of bromidic description, but the comparison to sugar does give you a cer certain sensory uh, focus on the whiteness of the snow. It's a little bit more colorful uh, than merely saying that the snow was white. Now on the other hand, supposing I'm describing sugar, and I can do it in reverse. I would say the sugar in the bowl was as white as snow. And that gives you a better impression of the sugar than if I just said the sugar was white. Now ask yourself why. The trick of any comparison or any metaphor is actually the principle of abstraction. By introducing another concrete with the same attribute which you want to feature, you make that attribute stand out in the reader's mind. If you describe only one object and describe it only in concrete terms, 
uh, it's pretty difficult uh, to convey. You, you might describe it. Uh, in other words, you'll tell about it, but you won't show it. By showing, I mean, you won't achieve the sensuous impression. The impression uh, which will give the reader the idea of your style being powerful. The reader uh, will say or feel, I'm actually able to see the things you're describing. Well, the uh, way to make him see things is to follow the rules of human epistemology. And uh, if you want to stress a particular attribute, there is no better way to stress it than by introducing some other irrelevant uh, concept, such as snow in regard to sugar, stressing what attribute do they have in common. It's the lightning-like visualization by the reader of the whiteness of snow and the whiteness of sugar that will make that whiteness stand out in his mind as if he had seen it. That is what will give the sensory impression. Now, the example I used is a very simple bromidic one, but the same principle applies to all comparisons. Whenever you see an apt comparison or read an image which uh, makes you think, oh, this is well said, observe that the principle there will always be the isolation of the particular attribute which the uh, author wants to feature. And the isolation of it by means of forcing the reader's mind to form an abstraction. That is, by introducing another concrete with that attribute, so that the two together give you a very clear, sensuous image of the attribute you want to feature. And in this sense, you have to watch very carefully the issue of connotations. Let me give an example. For instance, if you used an old bromide, such as her lips were like ripe cherries. Well, it's not too bad if said for the first time, because you have the association of something red, sensuous, glistening, uh, rather attractive. But supposing I said instead, her lips were like ripe tomatoes. <laughs> now, tomatoes also are red and shining, but uh, why does it sound ridiculous? Because the connotations are totally wrong. Because when you think of ripe tomatoes, you think of something squashy, uh, and you think of the kitchen or of a bad and appetizing salad, and everything that is connected with the concept of a vegetable is not very romantic, whereas a fruit may be. So that in that sense, when you select comparisons, watch your connotations. Uh, it isn't only a matter of the attribute that you want to feature being exact. It's also a matter of what kind of connotations will that other concrete which you introduce uh, uh, raise in the mind of the reader. Uh, if you are describing something which you want to sound attractive, be sure that all your comparisons are in the glamorous and attractive style. In fact, and by the kind of connotations that they will evoke. When you want to destroy some character, do the opposite. And as an example of that, I, I will give you my description of Tui in the fountainhead. You remember I said his ears stuck out like the handles of a bullion cup. Uh, now, it's not only the matter of uh, ears that are prominent uh, being an attractive, but it's the very undignified comparison. If I had said they stuck out like wings, that would have been bad writing, because uh, the fact I'm mentioning is unattractive. Uh, but the comparison to wings suggests something glamorous and with a rather attractive, soaring connotation. Therefore, that would be bad writing because it would be good connotations uh, brought into a description intended to be derogatory. That would be the opposite of describing a beautiful woman comparing her lips to ripe tomatoes in that sense. Uh, there you had a in description intended to convey beauty, yet you introduced a comparison of wrong connotations. Now, it's by means of the selection of, your, of the connotations of your comparison that you can do the best kind of objective slanted writing.
By objective, I mean that the mind of the reader that would draw the conclusion. It's not you, uh, as a writer, that will call the reader's attention to the fact that this person is ugly or undignified. If you uh, tell it, if you assert it in narrative, that is what I call the editorial method. That is telling, not showing. If you want to sound objective, you have to show, meaning you have to make the mind of the reader draw the conclusion. And the way to do it is to select the connotations of, of your comparison. You can do it even with simple adjectives. For instance, if you say that the man was tall and slender, that's an attractive description. But if you say he's tall and lanky or tall and gawky, it's quite a different thing. There are certain uh, adjectives have a very definite uh, connotations or shades of meaning. Now, the same principle, only with a much wider selection left for you, applies to descriptions by means of comparisons. Uh, if you, uh, the same quality, whether it's tallness or uh, way of walking, face, or anything about a person, can be described as attractive or not according to what kind of comparisons or metaphors you use in the description. Now, uh, Vivian, I think this uh, answers your question number two in the questions you submitted. Are there any general rules about which types of imagery are good and which types should be avoided? Mm -hmm. That is what you had in mind, mm -hmm. this kind of <coughs> issue. Uh, outside of it, a general rule of this kind, there are, of course, no limits to uh, how many images you can use, of what kind or where. The only rule is to watch it, okay, that the images you use fit your purpose and are in the same style and bring the desired kind of connotations. Besides that, a uh, small thing to remember is also not to overload things with images. Uh, if you have a colorful metaphors uh, in any one paragraph, Stay away from them for a while. In other words, don't overload the same paragraph with one metaphor after another. That uh, can have the opposite effect of the one you intend. Instead of making the description more col colorful, you blunt the perception uh, of the reader. He is lost between so many concretes out of different uh, categories that they cease to work on him epistemologically. You can confuse a reader and instead of stressing or featuring the exact impression that you want, it, you can blunt him to the point where he doesn't, uh, isn't following your metaphors at all and has no impression left in his mind. Uh, it will be like showing too many pictures too fast and at the same time. Therefore, avoid uh, too many fancy images or metaphors too close together. And above all, avoid two metaphors to describe the same thing. You might find sometimes that two very attractive images or very clever ones occur to you to describe the same person or the same object. You just have to be ruthless and select whichever one you think is better. Never use two for the same thing because a repetition is always weakening. It has the effect, as I think I mentioned before, it has the effect of projecting the author's doubt if the author was not sure that the first description was firm enough and had to say it the second time. Uh, now there's the small matter of such issues as the use of slang, of foreign words, and of swear words. Uh, we don't have to pause on that for too long. Too long. I only want to mention this. When you use slang, be very careful that you don't use it in narrative unless it's intentional. If you write in the first person, uh, best example of which would be, for instance, Mickey Spillane, and the person speaking is supposed to be uh, a man talking colloquially, then it's quite all right to use slang expressions. In fact, it's very colorful. But don't do it when it's supposed to be straight narrative. On the other hand, there are slang words which have become or are becoming part of the language. And there you have to exercise your judgment. Sometimes the right slang word is more colorful, <clears throat> more eloquent in the narratives than any 
a normal vocabulary, but you have to use your judgment as to the nature of that slang word. And the rule there is as follows. You will observe that the kind of slang that remains in the language and eventually does find general acceptance and, and is included in a dictionary is the kind of slang word for which there is no actual uh, legitimate equivalent. Slang is a very col colorful form of a language development and sometimes slang words uh, are created precisely to fill a ling linguistic need for which no exact equivalent exists. In those cases, it is all right to use a slang word uh, when you know that uh, no normal or respectable English word uh, will give you the exact shading, provided, of course, it's a slang word which is generally known and has been in circulation for some time. On the other hand, the kind of slang which changes every year is the kind that is strictly artificial, started by someone, repeated out of social metaphysics for no other reason, some expression or other which is not needed, for which exact and better words exist in the language, and the kind of slang which is used for some purpose other than communication uh, of meaning. They always local affectation. There will be some college expressions or some Middle Western expression uh, of some group or some geographical locality that start some nonsense, which is repeated strictly because it is an affectation. Uh, and that kind vanishes. A year later, nobody knows what the expression means. Don't use those words. Unless, of course, you're writing one of those journalistic stories, which is of the split second, and you intend it to be dead within a year, uh, then use the latest if you want to. Since I doubt whether any of you will write that, avoid that kind of slang. Uh, now, in regard to uh, use slang in dialogue, that, of course, depends on what kind of character you're describing. But the one rule about the slang of the split second, or the slang of affectation that you were mentioning, uh, that should not be used even as characterization, because it's too perishable and too phony. Now, as to obscenities and four-letter words, I would say categorically as an absolute, do not use them. And never mind all the arguments about this is realism. Uh, if, again, if you're writing something very naturalistic, maybe you could justify yourself for using it. But even then, I would question uh, that usage even in the most naturalistic kind of writing. Why? Because obscenities, as I mentioned briefly before, are not actually objective language. They are slanted language to begin with. They are value language. They are a language which consists of implying a whole value judgment of condemnation, contempt, or evil about certain issues. It usually has to do with certain parts of the body and sex. Oh yes, in parenthood and illegitimate birth. I mean, those issues, and again, that's all connected with sex. The whole nature of obscene language is the metaphysics and the morality of the antibody school of thought you will observe that the more religious the nation, the more violently obscene and varied its uh, four-letter war repertoire. They say that the uh, most obscene in that respect are the Spanish. I don't know Spanish, but I do know that Russians, for instance, have a whole sub-language, not just uh, single words, but sentences and expressions, uh, most of which I myself do not know but I know the general trend or know a few samples, all of them to do with sex. Uh, one second. And now, you see the implication of that. It is not then an objective language which you can use to express your own value judgments. It is a language with prefabricated, ready-made value judgments and consisting 
specifically of the denunciation of sex and of this earth and of conveying that death is something low, obscene or damnable. You don't want to subscribe to that premise. I was just going to ask, well, what about the place in which Reardon calls somebody a bastard? Why did you decide to do that? Precisely to show that he did subscribe to that premise? Or? Oh, no, because bastard now is actually part of the language. That's not an obscenity. You mean it's illegitimately one of the things that one didn't want? Oh, not, not that that... Yes. You didn't mean a particular term. No. Uh, there are, oh, there are such fancy uh, swear words about your mother being a bitch and, and your uh, unknown fatherhood and expressions like that in, in European languages. I mean, who prefabricate canned expressions to ex express contempt for the fact of sex or illegitimate birth? Now, the word bastard in English, as it's used today, does not connote illegitimate birth, although that is the uh, root of the word, of course. Rat. It simply means uh, a rat, <laughs> well, a scoundrel or a jerk or all the rest of it combined. You know, incidentally, as a side issue, it's very interesting. There are no words in English uh, to convey a worthless man as an insult. I think scoundrel is the only one, and you never call, pardon? Blackguard. Well, blackguard or rotter. And now those are more British, and you never hear people using that. They're more antiquated and formal and uh, literary. Now, the language as such does not have a word to express uh, a value judgment of a bad kind on a man. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons why bastard became pa part of the language, it's not a language you would use in the drawing room, nor uh, would you call someone that to his face unless you intend never to see him again. But that Reardon uses it. Uh, he used it the same way any of us would use it. We do not mean to refer to the fact of illegitimate birth. It's just that it's the only word that has served that purpose in English. Now, incidentally, in Russian, there are about 10 or 12 words that I can think of that are words on the order of the present usage of a bastard. In other words, words that people do use, and even more polite than that, words that can be used in a drawing room. All of them variants on what scoundrel would be in English. All of them uh, expressions of contempt for a man's moral character. And I think that's very significant. Significant of the metaphysics, uh, or the morality of the two languages is that the amount of words to express human evil in other languages is much greater than in English. And I give great credit to America for that fact. Even black garden scoundrel and rotter are English, British, not American. Uh, now, coming back to the uh, issue of four-letter words. If you ever have to write about, even in a uh, romantic story, which, after all, if it's romantic realism, you will want to suggest the, the reality of certain people or certain uh, groups. If you have to write about low-down uh, slum inhabitants or any kind of situation like men in the army, where uh, modern writers specialize in conveying, which I do not fully believe, is meant that men in the army talk in nothing but for letter words, that I do not believe, but I do believe that under stress, uh, I have heard truck drivers and men of that sort use some of those words. Now, if you have to establish that kind of atmosphere, you have a rather difficult literary problem. Uh, a few darns or dams won't quite do it, uh, but on the other hand, there's no necessity to go uh, into prefabricated, ready-made language just for the sake of uh, realism. You don't have to use the four-letter words. How is it then done? Well, the trick would be to suggest by the context of what is being said, that it's abusive or violent or obscene, but don't use the actual terms. Grant you that it's done, it is extremely offensive. N nothing is accomplished. And you can avoid it 
on the same principle um, by which you would avoid describing bowel movement functions or horrible operations or any kind of ghastly physical illnesses which you may suggest if you want to uh, have a description of horror, but you don't have to go into every detail of the color of an infected wound or the maggots on a dead body or any horror like that, which modern writers do do. The rule that you have to observe there is always to ask yourself, what is the purpose? As in everything else, purpose will dictate the choice. If your purpose is to express a general horror, well, you can suggest it in issues of this kind by the tamest, least offensive of the kind of details that you could mention. If you say that uh, someone stumbles upon a half-decomposed corpse, that is sufficient. The, the mere uh, statement conveys exactly what you want. Then to proceed to describe it in every kind of horrible detail uh, can only achieve the purpose of horror for horror's sake. And that is where you have to let your purpose be the judge. If you're ever tempted to describe something ghastly, ask yourself what you're doing it for. If it's to suggest horror, uh, one or two generalized lines will do it. Beyond that point, it becomes just for shock value and shock of the worst kind. Uh, it's shock on the principle of the police gazette, in effect. Readers who uh, like to read horrors for horror's sake that might uh, consider themselves pleasantly shocked. No rational person would. Uh, all that you will achieve is that no matter what the rest of your book, that book will always have connotations in the mind of the reader to that particular horror touch. Therefore, be very careful of that. Never go into horror, ugliness, or revulsion for its own sake. When you want to suggest something on that order, a general suggestion is sufficient. Now the use of foreign words. That is also, uh, that's a small issue, but many writers very often make, make that mistake. Do not, in narrative, use foreign words uh, to show your erudition or education, because that is all that it uh, accomplishes. Uh, you know the way in which phonies like to start their conversation with foreign words. Uh, if you do that in, in narrative, uh, all you achieve is that you, the author, will sound like a phony. Now the same applies to dialogue. If you are characterizing a phony and you have him use foreign language occasionally, then that's legitimate. I've done that with Guy Franklin. Uh, but don't, as a great many bad television and movie writers do, uh, more particularly, but novelists do it also, insert foreign words uh, for the dialogue of positive characters if the story is led in a foreign country. There is a very bad contradiction involved. You've pr probably seen that. Supposing a story is led in Germany. Characters are speaking in English. Now, you know that the assumption is, in fact, they're speaking in Ger German, but uh, the story is written in English. And suddenly, you will have words like Liebchen, or uh, in Germans, or uh, swear words in German, in the middle of an in English dialogue, which is supposed to be German anyway. You understand that in such a case, it has the same effect as the one achieved for Guy Francon, who would suddenly use uh, French words just to show that he can speak French or that he's elegant. Uh, if you as an author writing a story with a foreign setting, suddenly, for no reason, insert words in the language in which the story is supposed to be played anyway. The sole effect is that you are showing off that you know if, uh, a few German words or have just looked them up in the dictionary. That is all that it can accomplish. Pardon? Uh, it's also a process that uh, 
to movies where it's not so you can try to the foreign country where they do because they have to speak English or German accent. Well, yes. That, that also is tremendously funny. Sometimes they, they do it simply because they want to use the actor. But I've seen them do it with American actors, assuming the foreign accent. And that is as preposterous and contradictory as anything could be. Now, a, a serious issue in the last of the uh, elements included under style is the issue of journalistic references. And by that I mean using in a story the kind of names, dates, or other uh, names proper which pertain to a certain period too journalistically and too concretely. Sinclair Lewis is the archetype of uh, those who use it most frequently. But uh, everybody, even including me, has sometimes been guilty of that. When I say even me, it's because I'm very much set against it now. But I didn't discover the principle myself. Someone pointed out to me, and uh, it's one of the most valuable advice I've ever heard uh, in regard to writing. What do I mean by journalistic references? Well, it's using, for instance, the names of living authors if you're writing a story of today, or actual song hits of this period, uh, or political figures. The rule there actually should be, if you want to avoid journalism, the, do not use anything of that nature older than at least a hundred years. More recent, yes. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes. Uh, it's the same issue as naturalism versus romanticism. Anything which has survived for a long time becomes an abstraction. But the celebrities or the fame of the moment is too temporary to be included in a story which deals with essentials and not with the particular details of the moment. Uh, but what is particularly uh, bad and dates a story is reference to political issues. You know, there's nothing as old as yesterday's newspaper. And the kind of issues which are big today, two years later, uh, are barely remembered. Avoid words like McCarthyism, uh, Roosevelt, Hoover, Truman. I mean, figures like that. They're in most modern writing, and that is precisely what one should not do. Now, when I say I myself have been guilty of it, the one thing that I remember in the Fountainhead, which I regret, is describing the, the devil drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola. I shouldn't have done that. Now, in With the Living, I have all the journalistic references, specific dates and the Lenin-Trotsky split and all that, but now there is a journalistic novel in a certain sense. It's not naturalism, but it's a novel specifically set and dealing with the politics of a certain period, and there it's more legitimate. There I wouldn't change it. But whenever you deal with a novel with an abstract theme, not a specific historical theme, when you deal with history, then of course you mention the politicians and and the concrete of that period. When your theme is not historical, where your story is intended not to mean and apply to only this particular period in time, such as the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrug, then you avoid all references to the proper names of the time, the concrete, the journalism. But that's very much of a landmark by now. There I think the rule should be, again, the time element. For instance, uh, the George Washington Bridge or the Triborough Bridge, the Empire State, that which has become part of the city, I would classify under the same heading as using the names of streets, as that would be proper. But don't use the building that just has been erected. Exactly. Uh, the principle is let something become established wider than the immediate moment. Now, is this principle clear? Really? Uh, I have a question. It's getting reference to uh, language. I was wondering, uh, if you're describing a character and you want uh, 
this is an exogenous example. Uh, is it proper to you to write out the dialect as it's pronounced? You know, instead of having I, I have no. A, A. That is always ignored me. Annoyed you? Yes. Me too. Uh, in lighter fiction, or a magazine articles, or lightweight satires, it sometimes is very funny. Uh, but in uh, what is intended as serious literature, it's very bad. And more than that, uh, if you wanted to convey some special way of pronouncing, devise your own need of doing it. But what they do, is, uh, it's a standardized form. If it's Southerner, he would say you all, or uh, why uh, you, I believe, instead of why all you uh, for yeah or something. I don't know. Uh, they have uh, standard phonetics for that, which become a bromide and do not even project the characterization as it probably was intended originally for that purpose. Today, it's merely a bromidic shorthand to substitute for characterization. Here is what's permissible. If you do it individually, you might have a foreign character in the story who mispronounces words in a certain way, or he has a slightly Germanic uh, way of sentence construction. Certain foreigners have a characteristic way of talking, particularly if they don't know English too well. And if you want to convey that, that is legitimate if you devise your own way of doing it. And if you paraphrase or present his particular grammatical structure rather than just the mispronunciation. Now, when I said don't use uh, any artistic references younger than about a hundred years, uh, it is uh, for the purpose of not cluttering up an abstract level story with journalistic reference, because uh, the writer of the moment, uh, even if he, you think he's going to be an immortal, and maybe he will be, nevertheless, in the story, he will project something too much of the moment. Uh, same applies to me. It is all right to use uh, Chopin or Rachmaninoff. Uh, well, Rachmaninoff is fairly recent, but uh, he's so obviously a classic. And he has been on the scene so long that, that that does not date the story. But I would not use any contemporary composers or artists, and certainly not writers. But uh, modern fiction uh, is cluttered up with the very latest, and just read it five years later. And it's more dated than the custom, than, than the latest fashion. Now, in Atlas, as you probably noticed, I didn't use anybody uh, younger than Plato and Aristotle. Mm -hmm. I think those are the only two actual names used. And you see then why uh, more uh, near kind of references would be proper in the fountain here. Because there, uh, it, uh, after all, it is a story laid in a certain historical period, even though it's not an immediate moment till the fight for modern architecture is localized in a certain period, historically. But Atlas is <coughs> no period. Therefore, it had to be kept most abstract. It is much better to explain, even were you for some reason to use something of today, of the past five years, if you explain what it is, that gives a certain feeling of distance and objectivity and abstraction, rather than relying on the immediate journalistic context in the reader's mind. Uh, right now, this then will conclude the issue of style, of, uh, of which we had five lectures. And we'll proceed now to smaller uh, individual questions of various, about various forms of literature and the questions that we've been raised. Uh, now, incidentally, don't let's have a class discussion. I had this scheduled for 15 minutes and has taken me exactly 55. Uh, questions are all right uh, if something is confusing, but uh, we went into actual discussion and that slowed us down. So let's have this procedure. If something I say is unclear, uh, then of course ask questions. If not, if it's just elaboration or asking me how about something connected, make a note of it and let's have a question period later and then we can discuss it. Uh, but don't uh, let's interrupt the course because I found myself fighting against you. 
in the sense that I wanted to get uh, over this part. And instead of that, we went into over-elaboration. Now, the first question that was asked is to state the distinction between novel, short story, and play. Well, we had discussed that in our preliminary sessions, but this is just for the record for the whole class. Uh, now, the difference between a short story and a novel is the fact that a short story is a one incident story. A novel necessarily is a series of events. Or a novel may be constructed uh, around the events of one day, but then by means of flashback or otherwise, it will be extended into a very complex structure. But if you uh, want to present just a single incident, uh, which has a beginning, a uh, middle, and a climax, that is the structure of a short story. Now the difference between a short story and a novelette is one only of physical length. A novelette is an in-between form. It can be nearer to a novel in the sense that it will pre be more than a single incident. And it will present a whole development as Anthem is, for instance. But Anthem will have this in common with a short story that although it deals with a long development and with many incidents, it deals with them in a very abbreviated form. Almost like what I call an impressionistic painting. That is just in a few brief essentials. It is not fully developed. It merely suggested. And therefore, that uh, aspect pertains to the short story technique. And the fact of a series of incidents pertains to the novel technique. And the length will place it just between the two mediums. Uh, on the other hand, you might have a single incident short story, but which takes uh, so many details and so long in the telling that it might become a novelette. So that there are no strict, uh, specific rules, but it's more or less a continuum from the short story to the novelette and from the novelette to the novel. Uh, the novel, as I say, is just the missing link <coughs> that will have length as its uh, main definitional attribute to distinguish it from novel on one side and short story on the other. But a short story, apart from being of limited length, should properly deal only with one incident. If you string out a whole series of incidents in the length of a short story. The length alone will not give you the right form. It will merely be a bad short story because it will then turn into merely a synopsis of something that should have been longer. Uh, are you clear on what I mean by a single incident? There's some one problem set up and result without too many complications, like a one act play. A single climax that you're building up to and concluding within that story. Now, it might be, as we discussed last time, we mentioned a story, short story, of Noel Coward, in which uh, you begin and end on preparing for a certain meeting and the meeting, and a long flashback in, be in between. But that still is the framework of a single incident, because your focus is as we discussed, on the one event of a certain meeting. Uh, and, that's, and the problem of that meeting is what you set up at the beginning and conclude with at the end. A novel uh, is a structure of a very complex, long-range purpose, which has to be reached by means of many more incidents and problems than just one. Uh, a good short story is focused on one problem uh, and its presentation. Now, a play, of course, is distinguished from novels or short stories by the fact that it dramatizes, meaning that the whole story has to be told by means of dialogue. A play cannot rely on any narrative. Certainly, stage directions are not narrative. And incidentally, should never be uh, written with any literary elaboration. 
uh, what the purpose, the, the, the means, the tool of a play is only, the, as far as the writer is concerned, is only the dialogue. The dialogue and such stage directions as are to be executed by an actor. Sometimes silent action is crucially important, but what's important then is only to convey the action, not to describe it, because the play is not supposed to be read, it's supposed to be seen and acted. Um, I'm not quite clear on this for one reason. Um, I have two questions. One is regarding the next January 16th, Jumbi is alive there, and I like very much how she mounted and stepped like a queen, uh, a queen mounting uh, a scaffold, referring to Karen, and she's uh, mounting a... Uh, yeah, but that's merely indicating, uh, by means of a metaphor, uh, a certain kind uh, of uh, air that I want the actress to assume. Okay. So it's a more, more or less irrelevant, not put in for literary purposes, but to, to project something. Now, uh, my second question regards uh, TV plays. I haven't uh, read very many, but I've been uh, looking through a book which did have TV plays in it, and there's a tremendous amount of indication of emotion, which I have never seen before. In other words, uh, you're told what emotion the actor is experiencing while he's saying the lines. Is this more or less uh, playwright's laziness in terms of the lines aren't doing the work? Oh, I, I've never seen that. Uh, I don't know what, uh, which particular I mean, thing you refer to, but as a general principle, uh, the playwright, uh, and that applies to stage, screen, or TV plays, should indicate the emotions if the line themselves hmm. are of a kind that can legitimately be read uh, in different moods and the specific emotion complements the lines. Well, the thing is this, that in the city play, each line, but, I mean, every time one particular character speaks, you're told exactly what, how he's speaking. The tone well, that, uh, I think, simply technical overwriting, unnecessarily on the part of the writer, if, uh, if I understand what you mean. Because the rule there should be, again, purposed. It is what you insert. Mm -hmm. If uh, by the context, it's obvious that the man is angry and the line is, get the hell out of here. Uh, it's not necessary to say angry. Mm. But let us suppose that uh, for the purpose of characterization, you want that line to be said deadly quiet. Then you will indicate quiet, get the hell out of here. Uh, you indicate the nature of the kind of emotion that you want the actor to project when there is a characterization purpose for indicating it and when the emotion either contradicts or is not necessarily explicit in the lines uh, presented. But uh, if the line in logic demands a certain kind of emotion from the character and that's the emotion you want, it's not necessary to indicate it to the audience. I suspect that what you saw was an awful lot of useless overwriting. What, of course, you must never do, as far as playwriting is concerned, is to go into long asides about what the characters feel. Uh, for instance, uh, something like, his heart is breaking. He is seeing his whole world collapsing. Uh, uh, he is torn inside. He says angrily. <laughs> Out of all this, all you needed is the angrily. In other words, the psychology of what's going on inside will not be projected by the actor, therefore it uses overwriting on your part. You indicate only that which the actor in fact needs to know. Uh, now, uh, same considerations apply to screenplay or TV play. And as far as the technical definition of the medium, uh, a screenplay and a TV play are extensions of the theater. That is, there are also stories which have to be presented strictly by means of only dialogue and such emotion or silent action as can be executed by a person. You cannot have introspection, you cannot have narrative. The difference you know, of the most obvious kind between 
a play in the screenplay, it was called the uh, Freedom of Space. On the screen and in TV, you can uh, go all over the world. You can, within one second, show shots in New York or in Europe and go back and forth, but, which you can't do on a play, uh, in a stage. In a stage play, the fewer changes of scene, the better. Any multiple uh, see, uh, scene play is a weakness. Uh, I mean, multiple in the sense of too many changes of scenery. If it seems in the same set, the not in mere lapse of time, that is all right. But too many jumps uh, between uh, scenes, different settings, merely convey technical weakness in the structure of the play. Now, I would make a, a, exceptions for such a play as Cerno de Bergerac, for instance. But then, uh, you, you have changes of scenery, but you have long acts taking uh, place in those uh, scenes. In any uh, of the plays of that kind, of the classical uh, plays, if you have uh, frequent uh, changes of scenery, but on the other hand, you have a long stretch of action taking place in those scenes, that is all right. The reason why in a modern play multiple changes of scene are bad is that you uh, do not give the audience time, in effect, to watch the action. The intermissions and interruptions are going to be too much in proportion to the amount of acting time. It's for that reason that you have to balance your scenery changes very carefully and in writing a play, aim at the greatest economy possible in changes of steps. That is not only an economic issue of the moment. As you probably know in the New York theater, the change of one set is disastrous at that expense. Uh, but even in Atlantis, let us say if we ever got to a stage where you did, uh, in the theater where you didn't have union rules and all kind of extra expenses, even so, Literarily, in the logic of, of the medium, the same rule would apply. Uh, do not add extra technical burdens on a story. It's not only a question of financial expense, but just the technical burden of the change of scene and the interruption in the sense of long intermission. Uh, aim at holding your play to one setting if possible or a minimum of setting. The more economy in that respect, the better the structure of play. I think that is all that we need to say about the different forms. Now we'll go into the question of special forms of literature, such as humor, fantasy, etc. Now those questions have been asked. Some of them we mentioned in the, our preliminary sessions, but now we'll cover those in more detail. Now the first one, of course, is humor. And here, I would like to uh, define for you first what is the nature of humor. Uh, observe this, that humor, in essence, is a metaphysical negation. What we, what we find to be funny is that which is in contradiction to reality or incompatible to reality the grotesque and the incongruous. Let me give you an example. For instance, uh, take a bromide uh, of humor, kind of the crudest example of it. A well-dressed gentleman in, in top hat and tails is walking down the street and he's very elegant and dignified and he slips on a banana peel and uh, falls down in a ludicrous position. Now, why is that supposed to be amusing? Now, granted that probably none of us would find it particularly amusing, but on a low level of humor, that is the standard kind of joke. What is funny about it? It's the contradiction, the incongruity. That is, if a man is dignified and elegant and then falls down uh, over a stupid object such as a banana peel, a in other words, falls down in contradiction, to the kind of style that he was establishing, that is what is funny because it establishes the man in effect as contradictory 
or helpless. Reality undercut him. He is unfit to deal with it. That is what one left at. All the variants on that kind of humor uh, would be in bad sort of movie comedies, uh, would be variations like this. Uh, overdressed dowagers and the waiter spills soup on them at a fancy restaurant table. Uh, or people who act uh, presumptuous or stuffy and get caught in some homey or simple or ludicrous situation. The principle there is always those people are incongruous with reality. The reality they were trying to establish has been undercut. Let me give you another, another example. Uh, for instance, uh, if a man comes home, let's say, that's another classic bromide of uh, two real comedies, and you have seen that his wife is entertaining a lover. And as the husband is about to enter, she hides the lover in a closet. And there there proceeds all kinds of uh, comedy situations about how she's trying to keep her husband from opening the door of the closet. So she wants to hang up his coat and she's trying to prevent him, etc. Now, you've seen all of this. Why is that supposed to be funny? In effect, because you, the audience, and the woman in the story know the truth of the situation. You are in control of reality. The husband is not. He doesn't know something which you know. Therefore, you find the goings on very funny. Uh, he is out of control of reality. But you, in your knowledge, are in control. That is, in effect, the essence of humor. Now, then what we laugh at is really established by our metaphysics. If humor is the means by which we declare uh, our reaction to something that is metaphysically incongruous, metaphysically con contradictory, and we laugh because this is ridiculous. What do we mean by ridiculous? Unfit. A contradiction is what cannot exist. And the lowest truck driver who laughed at some joke and who never heard of A is A is nevertheless acting on that principle or reacting on it when he laughs at some contradiction. A contradiction cannot exist. When you're confronted with one, if it's not a contradiction at your expense, you can find it funny. But it depends what you find funny will depend on what it is that you want to negate. For instance, if you laugh at evil, and the literary form of that will be satire, that is a proper form of humor in the sense that you are denying the metaphysical validity of that which you're satirizing. If you find uh, anything that is negligible, funny, that is again a proper attitude towards reality. You laugh at that which you consider negligible. Now the vicious or malicious kind of humor consists of laughing at the good. Uh, the humor exemplified by the dignified gentleman falling on a banana peel is the metaphysics of a mind that does not want values to be serious. Granted that in that example the values are just of the crudest kind, nevertheless the principle is that. If you laugh at any form of value that suddenly shows a contradiction or shows feet of clay in effect, it's the validity of values that you're laughing at. If on the other hand you have a pompous villain walking down the street uh, and he's established that his particular attributes then are not dignity and elegance but a pretentiousness or stuffiness and he falls. You might quite properly laugh at that because what is then being negated is an affectation or a pretense, not an actual value. Uh, observe, you all know um, 
uh, in colloquial terms, that some people have a good-natured, benevolent type of humor, and others have a malicious type of humor. If you watch for what is the principle, the good-natured, friendly type of humor is never directed at a value. Uh, someone who has a charming sense of humor, in effect, always laughs at that which is either negligible or undesirable. It is a good-natured laugh which is, in effect, has the result of confirming your values. If you laugh at the contradicted, at the preposterous or pretentious, you are in that act confirming the real, the honest, or the valuable. But the malicious type of humor is always the humor that is aimed at some value. Now, I'm sure you all have friends, or I hope not friends, but acquaintances, of the second type. Whenever someone uh, directs his humor at something which is important to you, that is a malicious thing. The metaphysical implication there is the undercutting of a value. If someone is uh, joking in a way which stresses a value in you, that is a benevolent or, or good-natured type of humor. As a side proof of the fact that it is a metaphysical issue, I will point out to the fact that man is the only being that can laugh. Observe that animals do not. There is no such thing as a laughing animal. Uh, why is it so metaphysical? Well, because man is the only being that has a volitional consciousness, that has a choice between that which he takes as serious and that which he does not. Man is the only one who has the power to consciously identify this is re what reality is, and this is a contradiction of reality. Now, an animal cannot have such a concept as contradiction, and he doesn't even have such a concept as reality, except by implication. In the sense that an animal deals only with reality, but the concept, the abstraction, is impossible to him. An animal cannot have the issue of being volitionally unfit for reality. Man can. Men can find other men ludicrous if and when they indulge in contradiction. Uh, why? Because they have the choice of being consistent or not. If they're inconsistent, they are against reality. And the contradictions sometimes are tragic and smaller ones are funny. But no such issue can exist for animals. Pardon? Miss Rand was asked if she could tie this to the example of Dagny in the valley, asking one of the workers who looks like a truck driver if he were a professor of zoology. Well, what, what is the joke there? It's Dagny, for a moment, who is uh, contradictory. Not intentionally contradictory, but the joke is on her. In other words, she has made a mistake in judgment. She has decided that uh, since uh, everybody here uh, is something more than what he's doing at the moment. Then she assumes, well, since this man looks like a truck driver and is doing, uh, in effect, um, rough and skilled labor, he's undoubtedly a professor. Uh, therefore, it's her judgment that you're laughing. That is precisely why it's funny and why it's not uh, malicious humor, that it's not an important error of judgment. Uh, that, that is good-natured humor. It, what you're laughing at, really, is she is having an unusually good time in her bewilderment, because the whole setup is so bewildering to her that if she makes a mistake of that kind, it, you're only underscoring the preposterousness of the whole situation, but the benevolent preposterousness. That is why one can afford to laugh at it. But the best example uh, from Atlas that I want to give you as a, a statement of the difference between the two types of humor, you, some of you might remember, is the line uh, from the chapter on Dagny's childhood when she sings of the two different ways in which Francisco and Jim uh, laugh at things. Now, both of them are men who joke very often. 
And uh, she said there was an important difference between the two. Francisco laughed at things because he saw something much greater. Jim laughed at things as if he wanted to let nothing remain vague. Now, that is in effect the uh, definition of the two types of humor. You see, Francisco never, in the whole course of the story, laughed maliciously at anyone's self-esteem or value. When he jokes, it's always when he jokes with the good people, it's always, in effect, a compliment to them, to the issue, and to the world. When he jokes with Jim Taggart, then, of course, he's undercutting Taggart's reality. Now, Taggart is in reverse, observes that he will always joke at that which can hurt a person's values most, as he does with Cheryl. And it's in this context that you understand why I consider that one of the worst, most evil lines I gave to Tui in the Fountainhead is his advice, don't be so serious, you must always be able to laugh at everything above all at yourself. Now that's a line you have heard very often and I think of any one symptom, that is the worst line of this non-value age. Whenever, that is the le leper's bell of an approaching Luther. Whenever you have a society in which that line is repeated too often, uh, look out, that is the sign of the collapse of all values. And again, here is the metaphysical connection. What do we mean? when we say we don't take something seriously. Reality is that which we do take seriously. When you don't take something seriously, it means, never mind, it's not important, there are no evil consequences, it doesn't matter one way or another. You can say that only about the things which you do not value. If you have accepted the attitude that you take nothing seriously, well, then, of course, the first thing that you don't, don't take seriously is reality. Uh, if you take nothing seriously, it means you have no values. If you have no values, it means that the first value, which is the basis of all the others, has no value for you, namely your life. If nothing in life is serious to you, and nothing is important, then your life itself cannot be important and observe the style of magazines like the New Yorker, for instance, uh, which is sort of the archetype of the no-value attitude of today. Here is a publication whose moral principle, in effect, is that there must be no moral principle. The single code of values that nothing must be permitted to have values. Uh, observe most of the ma modern magazines uh, I think, for instance, Life and Time magazines and the others, all, most of the others in various degrees, do the same thing. Uh, how often have you seen them do articles, or so-called profiles, on celebrities which uh, they in fact support, or people uh, whom they want to celebrate, uh, with whom they agree, and it's always done in a snide manner of laughing at the very people they are glamorizing as heroes. If that style at one time was reserved only for enemies, and to do a ridiculing article was reserved by the press only for those with whom they disagreed, whom they wanted to denounce, today it's the accepted style for those whom they want to glorify or support. And that in itself is a devastating sign of the nature of, of the policy consisting of there must be a single value only, namely, permit nothing to have value. That is the worst of the contradictions of this age. And the literary style is, of course, affected by it. Pardon? Yeah, Jean Carr is, uh, I think, the most amusing writer I've ever read. Um, I've been thinking of submitting a question regarding Jean Carr and Noel Coward, because you had once mentioned 
regarding Al Khan, the fact that he has very glamorous sense of humor, and that when he's uh, singing this on that those management, he's uh, showing the virtues of the English. That's right. Now, Jean Hart satirizes in, a, in one way her children and her husband, but you get the idea that these are people you very much like to meet because they're very unusual and dramatic or exciting in a way. Yes. Well, uh, well, what is your question? My question was, I mean, this is, um, this is a woman who isn't really taking these things seriously, but it's the way in which she's... Uh, I, I, it's just the quality of the humor. Yeah. Oh, wait a moment. What is it that she isn't not taking seriously? Um, well, I mean, she isn't terribly solemn about, uh, for example, her, her husband. She will point out foibles in a way, but it, it doesn't come off as... Uh, oh, no, that isn't the principle. Uh, she, of course, I would classify her as a benevolent humorist yes. in the same way as no coward. But you haven't identified the method properly. She takes her husband and her children very seriously. What she doesn't take seriously is what she denounces as foibles. When she describes the, the, the story, the title story about her children eating the daisies. Now, allegedly, it's supposed to be a very great depredation on the part of the kids. But in fact, is that what she's saying? No, she does not consider that an evil. What she is conveying by means of it uh, is the kind of uh, liveliness or adventurousness or imagination of the children or the high spirits which she has such a hard time um, controlling. So that while she is allegedly complaining about the hard lot of a mother and how difficult it is to cope with children, and she even has a line there about uh, in the future, her children will te won't have to tell psychologists that we hated them because we do. That's what she doesn't take seriously. Her complaints or the hard uh, uh, work of a mother is what she laughs at. And the means by which she does it is that when she presents the kind of thing that she allegedly is denouncing, she is presenting the exact opposite that the children are charming, intelligent, and adventurous. Uh, par it's particularly eloquent in one piece that she has where I literally fell in love with one of her children, where she says how impossible it is to talk to, to one of the boys who is very literal-minded. So that if she tells him to, to throw all his clothes into the washing machine, he says, all my clothes? And she says, yes. My shoes, too? <laughs> and she said, well, no, not your shoes. All right, but I'll put in the belt. Uh, you remember the dialogue? Only it's longer. Now, what comes across is an extremely intelligent, rational child. And what she is laughing at, actually, is any kind of mother who would consider this bad or difficult. But what she is negating uh, is the difficulty of the situation and glorifying uh, the, the good qualities of the children that those situations portray. Same with no Carlton and Mad Dog. Now he's in effect saying how irrational the Englishmen are. When everybody else collapses, they still go out in the jungle dressed formally. Now is that an insult to the English or not? He is, again, he is laughing at the natives and the uh, caribou or whoever is snoozing that, but not at the English. <laughs> if you remember that name. Yeah. Exactly. Now, I was just going to give you a few examples of the two types of humor. For instance, the romantic humor, I don't know how many of you, or you're old, too young probably, have seen Lubitsch comedies on the screen. I think one of them you might have, and that's Ninochka. You know the Greta Garbo picture, Ninochka, which was uh, directed by Lubitsch. Now, he was the archetype, probably the only one on the screen famous for romantic comedies. And Ninochka is a very good example of it. It is a comedy, it is humor, but it is very high romance. Because observe that what uh, they are laughing at are the sordid or the drudgy or the uh, undesirable aspects of life and what is 
uh, what comes across by means of the humor is the glamour, the romance, and the positive. O. Henry is the kind of uh, benevolent humorist. Oscar Wilde, not all of him, but uh, a great many of his plays, particularly the importance of being earnest. Now, the humorous part of Cyrano de Bergerac, now that's a play that has a, uh, quite a lot of comedy in it. But again, if you observe all of Cyrano's humor, is always aimed at what? At destroying the pretentious or the phony or the cowardly. He's always laughing at villains, not at values, not at heroes. On the other side of that, uh, I read so few humorists that I'm slightly hard put to give you examples, but I would say, for instance, that Swift, who all of you are asking about, that is a humorist of a dubious kind. Don't question me in detail. I have read uh, Gulliver's Travels so long ago that I can remember nothing except that there was a lot of little little pushing. Um, but what I remember about this thing is that it is a satire against something which does not project what is the author actually for. He satirizes all kinds of social issues and social weaknesses, but he upholds nothing. Uh, in more modern style, I don't know how many of you have, re have read Dorothy Parker, who is a very famous short story writer and leftist, and she's a humorist. Now, she laughs in a very nasty and bitter way that she's supposed to be a very sensitive writer, but she manages to write in a semi-tragic yet humorous way about the most heartbreaking situations possible, like lonely old maids or ugly, undesired women. Humor as such, humor as an exclusive ingredient of a story, destruction only, without the positive, is a, a very dubious form of writing. I mean, it's an existing uh, form of writing, and some people have acquired great skill. It's a very rancorous one, and philosophically, very empty, because it is merely destruction in the name of nothing. Pardon? Isn't it possible to write a completely humorous work, which still upholds the values you wish to uphold? I'm thinking particularly of Alice in Wonderland, which is really completely human, and yet you are in no doubt as to what size we are on. You have uh, Oh, yes, that's humor and fairy tale mixed. Well, yes, that, that could be classified uh, along with the benevolence. So it's, I have certain reservations about that book, you know, of certain parts of it. But let's say, in the total, yes, you could include it under uh, the ones we mentioned as benevolent humor. What I mean is that it doesn't seem to be destructive. No, and it isn't, it's but... It's a completely humorous work. Well, but neither are the benevolent uh, uh, humorists that we mentioned, such as of Henry or Oscar Wilde comedies. They're not destructive either. But the method of humor there is the by means of the destruction of that which is the opposite of the values. Yet the values are also introduced, you see. And in Alice also, I mean, Alice herself is supposed to be the good, in effect. And what is satirized is the irrational. Uh, predominantly, but not exclusively. You know, it's an, uh, it's an odd uh, little piece of work. And not a lot is so good in it, and other parts are, seem to be undercutting it, but that would be a complex issue. As a whole, one could say yes, that that would be classified on benevolent humor type. But you see, in the benevolent humor type, there is always the positive hero or heroine, or something good is involved, like in miniature, where the hero and heroine are quite glamorous. But the, still be funny. the form in which uh, the story is told is funny, they are not funny. Some of their adventures are funny. Or they are uh, acting humorously towards certain things, but humorously in the way of Francisco. Uh, not in the way of undercutting their dignity or their value or their self-esteem. I'm bringing this question up in connection with the discussion we had, I think, last week. About yeah. negatives? Yes, in that I understood that the conclusion of that discussion was that actually it was not really completely proper to write a completely humorous work because it was not a criminal enough. 
Oh, I'm no. No, I will, uh, wait, I will, uh, on the separate issue here, take up uh, the issue of uh, negatives. You mean the, uh, the discussion about a writer like Dostoevsky, who only denounces but does not create the policy. There isn't quite the same issue as human. No, I was trying to raise the issue of human that opens Dostoevsky, and that was the question I meant asked then, and I felt that was the question it was answered. And now I see uh, I, I to see a different answer here. Oh. No, Dostoevsky would not come under humor. I know it. But the, the question there was, uh, is it all right to be against something or denounce yeah. uh, something without opposing what you're for? That is what we discussed. At, at, did we discuss humor? At, uh, uh, I believe your question was about humor, but it wasn't quite answered. Or, or the other questions started to come in, if I remember right. Uh, all on the issue of negatives, and that is somewhat different issue. I want you to be clear on this. Whether it's proper to use humor or not will depend on your remembering that humor is a destructive element, and then uh, how do you set up the story? Is it the destruction of the evil, the bad, the undesirable, or the inconsequential and false? And is the positive included? If so, then that uh, comes under the benevolent humor type and the uh, uh, whole work written in that style is completely proper. On the other side, if the humor is uh, aimed at the positive, at values, at the attitude of nothing in life is serious or sacred, everything is grotesque and ludicrous, if that is the... Uh, direction of the humor in a work, and it consists only of that, then that's a malicious, uh, malevolent universe form, and it might be very skillful literarily, but it would be very undesirable uh, and to be denounced philosophically. And under that heading, I would include satire for the sake of satire. That is, even if the things satirized are bad, <laughs> and are worthy of being destroyed or exploited. If the work includes no positive, but only the satirizing of the negatives, it also uh, is an improper li literary or philosophical form, but that will come more under the works consisting only of negatives, which I'll touch on later. Okay. Now the next uh, special form of literature to discuss is fantasy. And uh, under fantasy, we have uh, several different forms. The question asked by Vivian was, uh, is it proper? Uh, um, and is this form justifiable? Now, first, let's list the kind of stories that can be legitimately classed under fantasy. To begin with, there are stories projected in the future. Uh, and that is not strictly a fantasy story, but uh, fantasy only in the sense of time. And that Atlas Shrugged, of course, would, would be classified as that. So would Anthem, so would Orwell's book and the whole string of all the books. Uh, and that form is, strictly speaking, not fantasy. It is merely projecting something in time and illustrating or isolating uh, developments or ideas or issues which exist in the present. Uh, therefore, the only rule one could make about this type of fiction is that it should not be purposeless. I mean, it's a general a rule that uh, it will apply to all literature. Uh, namely, merely projecting something in the future for the sake of placing it in the future would, of course, be rational. Uh, the justification for that form of writing is when you want to show the ultimate consequences of some trend which exists in the present or some kind of application to actual living reality. If there is a rational application, if there is a rational lesson uh, or issue to be learned by projecting something in the future, then that projection is legitimate. Uh, then there's science fiction. Well, science fiction is any kind of story which projects future inventions 
do not yet exist. There are horror stories. Uh, there's magic stories or, or fairy tales would come under the magic stories. In other words, stories which project supernatural powers of a kind that do not in fact exist. There's ghost stories uh, and any uh, kind of stories of the hereafter, stories about heaven and hell and fantasies of that kind. Now, the same rule, in effect, applies to all these forms. They are legitimate and justifiable and rational when there is some abstract purpose applicable to reality involved in presenting the story in this kind of form. In other words, for instance, take science fiction. Uh, most of the real Verne stories, which were, I think, one of the first famous writers of science fiction, were extensions of the kind of uh, discoveries which were being made at the time, at the turn of the century, and which, in fact, he predicted. For instance, he had stories about dirigibles and submarines before these were actually invented. But that is perfectly legitimate projection. As it, uh, it is merely a literary exaggeration, in the same sense as any other form of literary exaggeration, of an existing fact. That is, if inventions exist, and if a writer wants to project new and greater ones, provided they are not supernatural or mystical, provided he stays in the realm of what scientifically may not yet be known, but is conceivable as possible, then that is a legitimate form. The same applies to fairy tales. Uh, if you invent stories like the magic carpet, or Cinderella, or the Sleeping Beauty, even though the means are fantastic, and in those cases, literally, metaphysically impossible. What justifies the story is the fact that you, by that means, project some message, some idea, some issue, which is rationally applicable to human beings. What you do then is uh, you indulge in metaphysical exaggeration, but the meaning of the story uh, is something applicable to human life. The best example of that kind of fantasy, I think, is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, here, the form is literally impossible. There's a man who changes himself physically into a monster. Uh, the literal physical facts of the story are not possible, but it is only a fantastic or symbolic device to convey most brilliantly a psychological issue. It is probably literally the best uh, study of its kind of a man with a contradictory set of premises or split metaphysics. Uh, it's the dramatization of a psychological conflict and done brilliantly. What I've always considered most interesting about the story is the fact that by allegedly magical means, he presents something which is psychologically very true. Namely, that at first, Dr. Jekyll uh, indulges by uh, some special power of drinking, some special medicine, in the fun of turning himself into a monster. That at first, he's able to control it. And then he reaches the stage where he can't control it anymore, where he turns into the monster whether he wants to or not. And that, in fact, is what happens to bad premises. That is, bad premises, <coughs> if unchecked, at first, might be hidden or controlled, but sooner or later they're going to take control of the personality. So as a psychological study projected into a fantastic form, it's a brilliant story. And as such, completely justifiable. In other words, the point of the story was not literally a man who could change physical shape. That was only the device or the means. Therefore, the issue of that story was rationally applicable to human life, and it was a very important issue. That kind of story, of course, is always justified. Now, what kind 
are not justified. The kind of fantasies which have no possible intellectual, rational, or moral application to human life. The kind of science fiction where you have things happen of no particular meaning. Uh, contrast two kinds of movies. For instance, I don't remember the title of it. What was the first Technicolor movie of the trip to the moon that started all the imitators? The movie was called Destination Moon. That's the one. Now, that was an excellent <coughs> picture. And uh, even if it is a projection of something that doesn't yet exist, it had used all the latest findings of science uh, to make it possible, or to make it appear rationally possible, even if the actual machine is not yet built, it was a very exciting, very interesting projection of a scientific achievement. But the follow-up of that story, the kind of movies where they have invaders from another planet, which are uh, man-sized ants, or octopi, or, or uh, all kinds of fantastic monsters with no particular meaning whatever. Now, here are physical miracles, not of some meaning, like the physical change into Dr., uh, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but simply uh, just rearranging reality. Wouldn't it be horrible if ants suddenly started walking around and conquering the earth? Well, what if they did? There is absolutely no meaning in it. If those ants were at least symbolizing some kind of special evil, so if they were like in a fable, animals representing dictators or the humanitarians or other human monsters, that would be different. But fantasy, for the sake of fantasy, in other words, simply a distortion of reality which has no other purpose or meaning, is certainly not valid and not very interesting. The same thing would apply to most ghost stories and horror stories. I don't know of any of which you could classify as rational or valid at all. Because what can be conveyed by means of ghosts or horror for the sake of horror, I don't know. Uh, there are some very interesting stories at times, and there have been very good movies which project heaven or hell, a fantasy of that kind. Uh, but that is, a, again, different. You see, again, it's not distortion or fantasy for the sake of fantasy. Those are always the ones who project some, by fantastic means, something which is relevant to human life and interesting. For instance, there was a famous play called Outward Bound. It's not too philosophical, but it was one of the first and interesting for that reason. It's uh, supposed to be passengers on a ship who discover that, in fact, they're all dead and they're now going to, to the last judgment. And... Uh, you look astonished, you never heard? Oh, it's a very interesting play. And the real purpose there was, uh, in effect, human characterization. By that means, uh, the author presented characters in very sharp, essential relief. It's not too profound, the play, but the structure was very interesting. Uh, in effect, the author projected the essence of his characters, uh, what they were on Earth. They start as a superficial collection of people and what happens to them, what they show when they learn that they are in effect dead and when the ship arrives they're going to meet an examiner who is going to decide what happens thereafter. Uh, now that kind of fantasy, again, because it has an application to actual human reality, is justifiable. Or a movie, I don't know if you've seen it uh, some years back, called Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Remember, that was a fascinating story. Very well done. It's supposed to be about a prize fighter who is sent back on Earth, uh, or his soul, he, uh, for some reason, which I don't now remember, he can't go uh, to heaven yet. Uh, there's been some mistake in bookkeeping. He's not supposed to be dead. Uh, so he has to come back in somebody else's body. And he comes back in the body of a millionaire who has just died. Uh, and the complications in the story were fascinating. 
But again, there is a general uh, rational human issue involved, and the fantasy is only used as the means. But the kind of ghost or supernatural stories in which all that you learn and the net result of the story is horror for the sake of horror. Vampires and Dracula and Frankenstein. Exactly. Uh, no, now wait a moment. Frankenstein is a very uh, symbolic story that has a great meaning and you hear it quoted constantly and that's why the name became almost a word like that. It is the story of a man who created a monster and then he couldn't control it and the monster got out of his control. So that in that sense, Frankenstein, the original one, mm. has a meaning and a purpose. But now Dracula, none whatever. And all the, all the werewolf stories uh, and the black cats yeah. that turn out to be the soul of some departed Cleopatra or something, those things are totally meaningless and inexcusable. Uh, I don't see the reading about the the Why do you say this is a very interesting story of uh, the men's romance in general, learning of a different uh, way of life by means of assuming that millionaires by the existence. What psychological story in fact? And with great suspense. Uh, I think Jim was here. Oh, well, that is the, uh, I never read the book itself, but that would, uh, would be the, the author's own uh, interpretation of it. In other words, <laughs> the author would, in effect, said he's anti-science, yeah. uh, in effect. But that doesn't, you, you can then disagree with his philosophy, but that does not invalidate this kind of story if that's what he believes. That kind of fantasy is a proper expression of it. And without accepting his philosophy, the, the symbol that he establishes is valid in a wider sense. Not that men shouldn't temper with forces. Uh, but, but that man should bear the consequences of, of his own uh, achievements or creations and, and should see to it that he doesn't create monsters that destroy him. And that is wider than just a niche of science or mysterious power. But, you know? I don't know how well you would classify uh, the story of modern life and civilization. Well, that's a sociological utopia, you know. That's, that's not, strictly speaking, fantasy. From which aspect we well, get? Well, the fact that they exist so long, not in Tokyo, and then they came there and so Well, that's just uh, only symbolic uh, projection. I would classify that story, generally speaking, under the utopia heading. Mm -hmm. And whichever element of the uh, supernatural is involved, again, it's only for a very specific purpose. I couldn't disagree more with the philosophy of anything than and that's it. But apart from the content, that is legitimate. Because the symbol there was that the, if they're on the right premises, or what the author considers the right premises, then they get eternal life for almost whichever advantages as all mystics or who so despise the earth are always so eager to get long life and uh, unending uh, Supplies of, of wine and milk, etc. Uh, How would you classify War of the World, which is actually just a story about an invasion and that has no actual meaning, and yet from the point of view in which he wrote it, it's supposed to signify the helplessness of man and the all powerful nature of God? Uh, well, H.G. Wells, I have under a very strong question. I've read all of him and I dislike what I have read. He always gives the appearance of some profound message or something, but actually, they're a fantasy for the sake of fantasy. Because in the War of the Worlds, it's what? The, the, the germ of the cold can destroy them by mankind. Yeah. Well, it's anti-science, it's anti-man, but the events selected are not, do not really prove it. You know, Frankenstein is anti-science in a more serious way. 
because the main plot of the story does present that idea if that's what he wants to present. Uh, but the fact that the uh, Russians are killed by cold germs is more a kind of a rather nasty satirical touch. It's not a religious touch. Because how does that prove the omnipotence of God? There isn't any God. All he's saying is nature can do what man cannot do. But is that a purge a philosophical idea, even if one you would disagree with, and therefore a justification for that? Uh, no, it isn't for this reason. What you could argue is that uh, he could get in by his teeth, uh, by the skin of his teeth, maybe. But here is why I would disagree with, uh, with that claim. You don't build a whole long complex novel of all the disasters and all the events just to illustrate that one point. Because if that is the whole message, it's a clever short story. Uh, so that that message is stuck in at the end of what is fantasy for fantasy say, and then it's given some kind of allegedly redeeming meaning. Then I would say if that was his intention, he failed literally. And uh, now let me see. Do you need uh, any other example? Because I think the issue is clear. What was the name of that author that you like? Surgeon. Yes. Surgeon. Well, now that is typical. N non proper fantasy. Because that is fantasy and horror was, was no discernible meaning, whatever, just for the pleasure of distorting reality. And another one, a uh, different style. I heard you referring to the movie Portrait of Jenny. Uh, it was on television, so if any of you have seen it, there is an example of the supernatural or mystical story that is totally unjustifiable. I mean, something about uh, fantasy on the nature of time, so that a man in the present falls in love with a girl who died years ago, but time is foreshortened, and she comes back to him at different stages of her life, within a very short period of time. He first meets her as a, a kid of 12, then as an adolescent, then as a young girl, all within a few months. And all of that interspersed with some very woozy dialogue on the nature of time and uh, are our poor minds, we can know nothing. Uh, and, and, and we know even less after we've seen the movie. So that, that kind of uh, playing with the supernatural just for the sake of the supernatural is, I think, in actual produced fact, the nearest that uh, we can come to that Cecil Salis story with which I opened the whole uh, lecture, that is when you're going to depart from reason altogether, then anything goes and then you get that kind of movie. And incidentally, to the credit of the public, it was a miserable flop as it should have been. <laughs> because there are many bad movies, but that one is pretentiously bad. Yeah? Uh, I'd like to talk about the song of Bernadette and the Joan of Arc, where it is clearly uh, non-reality. Well, there you have to argue with the author's philosophy. In, in the song of Bernadette, uh, the author presents the story of Bernadette as if it were a fact. Now then you, you have to fight with uh, or argue against his philosophy. And on that ground, it would be a story which would have no validity for anyone except those who would choose to believe. It's non-objective. Uh, but it's not a fantasy in the literal sense of the word. It's a religious tract. Uh, you could make the point that all religion is a fantasy, and that is true. But in that sense, not all fantasy, all fairy tales, and all science fiction presented as if they were facts. In other words, they're supposed to be credible. And it seems to me the only way in which one feels affronted to the religious pictures presented as facts is that one knows that there are people who actually believe it as facts. That's true. But if one didn't, then they would classify itself with all the other with all the other stories of somebody who made a Frankenstein. Pointless uh, fantasies. Somebody oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, except this. That's one issue. Just like the Frankenstein story. Yeah. Uh, except that religion is a fact. 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 Religion so it's not fantasy for the sake of fantasy. It's fantasy for the sake of a moral code. 
Now, then your fight has to be with the moral code. And if you ask me, is religion as such fantasy for the sake of fantasy? Well, yes and no. Yes in form, no in motive. So the motive there is much more vicious. The motive is the destruction of human life and human mind. But that is a different issue. As if religion claims to be a guide to life, then the issue there is, should man be guided by mystical dogma? But the fantasy for the sake of fantasy doesn't even attempt that claim. It's just simply horror uh, with no application to human life. I didn't mean that part of what I meant is that it can be looked at artistically on exactly the same level as any science fiction story or any fairy tale. Oh, yes. In that it is a, a purposeful fantasy. Uh, the difference, in other words, is it, it, outside of the, the framework of the art. That's right. <laughs> That's right, the difference is philosophical. In strictly literary terms, without criticizing the philosophy, you would have to say about religious stories that they are uh, in the category of exaggeration or distortion of reality for a purpose applicable to human life. But you certainly would be justified in fighting the purpose. In, in what sense is the presentation of adventure and struggle against evil sufficient to consider a story applicable to life. That is, if you have a murder story or some such story as that, where there's a war between good and evil, so to speak, but it has no wider meaning other than the adventure and the thought and the struggle necessary to conquer the evil, and that's justifiable in terms of murder stories, then could it be argued plausibly or rationally that if you go off to some other planet and there's an evil race there and you have to exercise skill and ingenuity and so on to conquer them, that this is equally the triumph of good over evil and man's thoughts and so on in the same kind of way and therefore... But, uh, but wait a moment, if you had a story in which uh, you projected an evil race on another planet, an evil in human terms, that would be justifiable, that would come under the uh, rationally applicable fantasy. But and they all evil? Huh? They all be evil? Who? No. 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 So, uh, you mean in the fantasies, in the kind of movies I mentioned? Yeah. No, they're evil only that they're after destroying men, but they represent nothing in particular. Oh. They're not morally evil, they're just physical monsters. And a detective story <laughs> is uh, certainly applicable to human life because such things as murders or crimes are committed and therefore it can be taken as a small scale example of a wider issue the fight against evil but in its own terms it's valid even in the narrow sense that this is not the greatest arena on which you fight against evil but nevertheless it's an arena and in that sense valid so uh, there it's only that the scale is small but the issue is perfectly rational. Uh, so Jim was next. Uh, I was just going to uh, raise this question on uh, uh, make this point on regard to the other discussion. Uh, if we want to have a science fiction story in which the other race is evil, that would be uh, the same thing as uh, uh, racism and birth uh, as a racism, why? Well, uh, in what sense could a, a race uh, be evil? Oh, well, not by... Assuming that there are... Uh, the oh, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting over words, actually. Uh, if you mean the born evil, then that's an issue of uh, wrong premises for the author. But uh, if you assume that they are volitional human beings, who have adopted an evil code, let's say it's a race uh, of dictators and slaves. Let's say that the, someone lands on Mars where there are conscious creatures, but they have a very evil way of life. That would be legitimate because it would be only a projection of an earthly evil. Oh, I mean uh, this. If, uh, if that were literally the case, that there were an evil race in the story, uh, all Martians were... Uh, out to uh, slaughter every earth, then uh, that would be so, uh, so absurd as to uh, 
You mean if they are deterministic, is that then it would come under the same category as the ant man, the cat man, and all those things? Yeah, this was known in science fiction uh, parlance, uh, the organic monster type of story. They, they made a name for it, called the family story. Is that what they're called? <laughs> well, uh, no, organic monster. <laughs> well, uh, again, there is, if they feature some kind of rational type of evil that might be justifiable, it's just craziness, then not. I mean, is there the definition of the type to answer itself? All right? Now, then, uh, again, in answer to Vivian's question, um, when and to what degree is symbolism proper? Now, what is symbolism? It's merely the presentation of some idea by means of concretizing it in an object or a person which represents that idea. It's a tra transference of action, in effect. And the one absolute about the use of symbolism is that that symbol should be legible. Otherwise, it's a form which is a contradiction in terms. I think the only types of symbolic writing is morality plays, which we discussed. There is a place in which men are supposed to embody the abstraction of uh, justice or virtue or goodness or freedom. Not men representing those characteristics, but men representing that abstraction in a kind of platonic archetype form. Uh, uh, in the same way as in fairy tales, you have the, the fairy uh, who is good or the fairy who is bad. In morality plays, you have moral abstractions presented by means of human figures, uh, like an embodied justice or an embodied virtue. Well, that's symbolism. And in that sense, it's uh, rather crude and, and a sort of a thankless dramatic form, a pur purposeless form, but legitimate if uh, the symbolism is made clear. You could, in a certain sense, call Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde symbolic, because their physical shapes were supposed to represent what, in fact, was a psychological conflict. So that Mr. Hyde, in that sense, is a symbol of psychological evil. Uh, that's legitimate symbolism. But you said Kafka or any of the modernists, where it's supposed to be symbolic, Meaning, it's supposed to represent something other than what it literally is. Only nobody knows what it represents. Uh, then you can't even call it symbol. And uh, that is talking of the form as a whole. There is a whole work uh, allegedly done by symbolic means. Now, as to the use of symbolism within uh, works which are not symbolic as a whole, the same rule would apply. If you want to introduce symbols, you do so only when and if you have very clearly established what that symbol is. As a small example of that, uh, it will be my uh, use of the dollar sign in that. Now, uh, I first established why it's used, and then every time I refer to it or bring it into the action or give it any emotional meaning in the scene, it's on the basis of that which that dollar sign is supposed to symbolize. But that's made clear. Or the cross will always be used in a religious place in that same way. Well, then the, there the symbolism is clear of what that cross stands for. But when an author introduces all kinds of triangles or swastikas or code of pyramids or whichever, and nobody knows what it means, then uh, that is outside the bounds of any rational propriety. That goes with uh, Gertrude Stein and James Joyce usage of words. Now, uh, here I'm discussing use of particular symbols. What is not a good method, and offhand I cannot think of any examples, but I know that there are writers who attempt in the middle of, a, in fact, normal, realistic, drama, to have sequences which are supposed to be only symbolic. 
Now that is a bad mixture and one that cannot be justified because it destroys the reality. If the action is supposed to be taken literally and then something happens which is only symbols of a man's soul or dreams, uh, then it's a mixture of methods. Yeah. Uh, with the illustration of that, uh, I remember what we studied with Dr. Falcon in school, uh, the teacher pointed out that uh, there was a line where uh, one of the men said to breathe, he walked into the room. They described how he walked in, and uh, that's what he turns on the line. This was supposed to be that symbolic, you could see someone who was uh, ideologically turning on the line, so he got that. But I thought that there was something like that would not at all be obvious to anyone who was reading the book, because everything else in the context was just a physical description. Well, uh, and in that sense, it's bad. But supposing that were made clear, that would be legitimate use. Because uh, physically, uh, what happens is he turns on the light. If it has also a spiritual, symbolic meaning, that is all right. If made clear. Uh, but what I meant is some, uh, some books would sometimes have dream sequences or things like that, which are supposed to ins inserts, which are supposed to be symbolic and always completely unclear. And that, the, the introduction of a symbolic sequence into an otherwise realistic story, and by realistic I mean here either romantic or naturalistic, but I mean a story which is intended to be taken straight, that is a very bad mixture. This sort of symbolism, the kind you mentioned, is proper and sometimes very effective if made clear. And An example of improper symbolism. Uh, there's a movie I once saw in which uh, context of the, the, the editor, uh, a boy meets girl in effect, and they come rushing towards each other, and then the scene shifts to two voices. Uh, I remember <laughs> that. Okay, that is, uh, you honor it by calling it symbolism. No, but is that the, that's the, the alleged intention, yes. Yeah. But the real intention is obscenity. Yes, of course, but uh, I mean... Yes, that is what is intended, so that would be uh, come under symbolism. I wanted to raise this question of uh, dream sequences in movies, particularly in musicals. So we have a very realistic story about a girl in the ordinary walk of life, and she dreams that she is dancing with yeah. the man that she knows, you know, and it's obviously meant to be symbolic, and it's very clear. Musicals, it's proper. In musicals, anything goes. Uh, the only uh, rules are being imagination. Uh, if it's properly integrated, uh, that's uh, quite legitimate. Yes? I don't see it right. Is that in any way symbolic? That means just what it says. You want to dance with the God. You like it. <laughs> oh, no, but sometimes they use it in symbolic terms. No, that, that, that might be literal, but sometimes they use things like uh, her subconscious escapes. I think Lady in the yeah. Dark used yeah. that sort of thing, and that's pretty bad. Uh, then? I think there was a story we studied at university which was supposed to be heavily symbolic in that kind of way. It kept switching from the symbolic to the literal, but it could be that I never understood any of them, so I'm wrong. <laughs> so it's Secret Sharer by Joseph Conrad. Oh, okay. Is that I never read that. Is that or not? Oh, yeah. I never read Two people were actually supposed to be one person, and every once in a while they would come back together, I think, into <laughs> one person, and split up into two again. I can't yeah, remember. there was a story that was supposed to be taken realistically along with it. Uh, yeah, oh, that, went that, on and, and they kept that switching the sort of thing that is miserable. The professor literally had to point out in this page it's meant symbolically and now it's meant literally. Did you ask him how he knew it? <laughs> he just had to know those things. Really? That's right, and, and, and other writers will write a key to it, and then the writer will write a key to the key, and in the meantime, whoever doesn't know the, uh, the latest key is not the elite, and that is the real purpose. Uh, no, that is uh, truly junk. But the other kind of symbolism, Vivian, the kind that you mentioned, Atlas Shrugged the School of it. What about the last chapter of part two, where Dagny is following him into the sunrise? It's not only symbolism, it's even a trite symbol, but so appropriate here that it was legitimate. In other words, uh, you can use even a bad symbol, bad in the sense of the most obvious, the sunrise.
but it was so literally true in this case that it fitted perfectly. So, it, you know, the, <coughs> I was playing it on two levels. In the literal sense, she was merely following a plane, and since it was late at night, they flew into the sunrise. And by the locale of the story, he had to go east, which was very carefully planned by the author very long in advance, uh, because the idea uh, fitted symbolically the story is so perfect in this moment that she had been in dark <coughs> for all this time now she is going to see the sunrise. And so the and, and the first light comes from the wind that is playing. Don't you didn't you notice all the I thought it was so obvious it had to be almost crude, but deliberately and intentionally crude, proudly crude. I object to anything else anywhere near our This is a bromide when it's when, when someone follows someone else, it's the sun on the ground. Where do you see it happening? <laughs> 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 well, I thank you. And you're right in one sense. That is, that, uh, it would be a bromide mm -hmm. if stretched. That is, if I said she's walking into the sunrise, that is a bromide. But here, uh, what? It's still a bromide, I mean, using the sunrise as the symbol of the good or the revelation. But what saved it is that it was, and why I consider it totally legitimate to use, uh, is that the physical action fitted. That, that is what you mean. Yes, that, that is my original use of the bromide. Uh, but I mean the mere fact of symbolizing something good by means of the sunlight or any form of light, it's a bromide, but you know, it's a bromide of the kind that love is. Uh, it's just so wide and so fundamental that you can't avoid it. And uh, what will make it, your use of it, a bromide or not, depends on whether you bring any originality to the subject or not. Yeah, but you can use it, you now need to use the sign as more of the good, but it was such a of the good that... Uh, to the point where she could no longer see him and uh, it's a deal really. Uh, <laughs> you mean it was well written? Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's one of the best written passages in it. And you're a very sensitive reader, as I've noticed before. And I thank you for it. And now we're clear on symbolism. And the next question was, what is the point of using tragedy or... How did you put it? What is the, the, the justification for representing tragedy in literature? Do you mean here, Vivian, the question of unhappy endings mm -hmm. or tragic endings? Well, that we discussed in brief. Uh, well, the answer, uh, the general answer to the use of tragedy, actually, I can uh, give it to you in one line from Gold's speech, or it's two sentences, that suffering as such is not a value, only men's fight against suffering is. In other words, to present tragedy for the sake of tragedy and total disaster would be a bad, malevolent universe story. But the rational justification for presenting tragic endings is only, like in the case of with the living, to show that the human spirit can survive even the worst uh, circumstance that can happen. Uh, even the worst that uh, uh, the chances or the evil of existence can do, either the chance of nature or the evil of other people, uh, will not defeat the proper kind of human spirit, will not kill that person's sense of values and of himself. Yes? But isn't there a sense in which we the living is not a tragedy? Well, only in that sense. It, but, I mean, it, but isn't that the, the, the crucial element of distinction, uh, in the sense that uh, where the, the uh, values which the book depicts come to naught, in the sense of the real unhappy ending type of novel, is there any justification for that at all? For the real unhappy ending? Yes. No. Right. Here we talk about philosophical justification not literary, actually, because uh, as far as literal rules go, uh, you can present anything you wish. That is, if you're a malevolent university, you can present a story in which everything and everybody is destroyed and the uh, philosophical theme would be that uh, 
life is malevolent, man has no chance, and uh, destruction is his fate. That will be the message. Now, literarily, man can carry out that scene, but the question here is philosophically. Mm -hmm. Is such a scene justifiable? And uh, on our philosophy, it certainly would not be. That, that is, to present suffering for the sake of suffering is totally wrong, philosophically, and literarily would make a pointless story. Uh, but there certainly are many of them, and some of them well written, as far as the literary quality is concerned. But now, we the living can be called a tragedy because in the events uh, as presented, all the good people are defeated or destroyed. Now, tragedy does not mean that the spirit uh, is saved. Uh, in point of fact and of events on earth, it is a tragic story. But the justification philosophically for presenting that story is to present a denunciation of the collectivist state and to show metaphysically that man cannot be destroyed by it. He can be killed, but he cannot be changed or negated. John? Don't the great classic tragedies actually follow along this premise? As I understand it, the original philosophy of tragedy, so to speak, was that essentially a person had to fall through a tragic flow. In other words, it was not that he fell because the universe was malevolent, but he fell because of a flaw in himself, which was a choice that he made. Oh, no. The rest of him, yes. uh, so to speak, presumably, is noble. Oh, no. But the tragic hero had to be a noble person. Well, he could be noble, but that, but uh, look at... Well, it's fine in Aristotle and, and the Elizabeth Beacons, it was necessary. The Elizabethan definition was, I think, the oldest world princes, and the Aristotelian was um, more prince. I don't remember, but there was a whole thing of tragic hero. Well, yes. So that he was heroic and that he had one flaw. Well, yes, but uh, observe this. If he has one flaw, no. not of his choice, and he is doomed by it. And no matter what the rest of his character, that flaw is destined to destroy him. There is not a free will uh, drama. If a man is a determined being, then there is really no disgrace for the hero if he is destroyed, nor any value if he is not destroyed. I certainly understand that, but what I do not understand is why you say these people are the victims. Because the concept of the tragic flaw was not the concept of the tragic error. See, if, if uh, the whole concept consisted of the tragic error or the tragic choice, then there's something else. But both in the Elizabethan and in the uh, ancient, the classical dramas, the idea was always the tragic flaw which a man cannot help, mm -hmm. and that no, uh, intrinsic, yes. And at no point was there any indication of why that man acquired that flaw. Now take King Lear. In the end, he decided that he was wrong. Never was there any explanation of why did he get that wrong idea that he said. He just had to have it. His vanity, uh, parental vanity, I think, is supposed to be the tragic flaw, whichever that means. He just had it, and it wrecked him, and he couldn't help it. And the same is true of Oedipus. Mm -hmm. uh, he's wrecked by fate. The gods made him marry his mother, etc. He couldn't help it. All those tragedies are deterministic. When they're deterministic, uh, the concept of morality actually does not apply, and that's the basic a conflict or contradiction in any kind of deterministic drama because, yes, Aristotle didn't see that the hero had to be noble and he had to be of great stature. But if you assume that he is born with his flow, he is also born <coughs> with his virtue and uh, with his stature, none of it has any meaning. And as I mentioned before, the fact that those plays were drama at all depends on the fact that uh, the audience and the author could not be consistently uh, deterministic. That you watch them and you experience any emotions only because you assume that some choice is possible. 
And if the defeated hero at the end still preserves some kind of nobility, you give him a certain credit only on the premise that that is his choice and that he therefore maintained his spirit. Uh, but philosophically, those dramas are malevolent universe because man is doomed through forces over which he has no control. Therefore, those stories, instead of having the effect uh, of with the living, that is, of affirming the freedom of man's spirit in spite of disaster, have exactly the opposite effect. I that, that. Uh, well, it's just yeah. only an example. The fact is, all that uh, it yeah. consists of in regard to this issue is the fact that all the good people in it are destroyed one way or another, but the heroine dies uh, radiantly endorsing life, in effect, feeling happiness in her last moment only because she had known what life properly should be. Now, those issues are relevant to a free will concept. But on a determinist concept, there is no such question as a man preserving his spirit. He preserves it or not as the determining power decides, whether fate or his own determined soul. So that this is a totally different issue. Now, the other example, for instance, of proper free will tragedy is still not the Bergerac. That the hero does die in fact, and he uh, is frustrated both on his career as a, as a poet and as a lover. Uh, but he maintains his values, his benevolent universe to the end. And the justification of that kind of tragedy is precisely uh, the fact that nothing broke his spirit and yet the author put every kind of disaster in his way, and you leave Sterno de Bergerac crying, but uplifted. You wouldn't leave a Shakespearean or a classical tragedy feeling uplifted. If you sit through it at all, which I don't like to, you leave the press at hell and the press with the feeling of the point. Now, is this point clear? Uh, and wouldn't you... Wine and then uh, Stadler would be a good example of the tragic choice or conclusion and kind of decision of the tragic flaw, because they're very clear there in both of them. What conclusions they come to at what point why? that that them yeah. I and mean, that it was an issue of their choice rather than that they were born with some kind of characteristic which is dooming them. That is true. Yes. And of course, is there also a parallel between the tragic premise of the warning and the tragic um, weakness, more or less? Because I mean, for Pharaoh, jealousy in his. That's what the brain is, a weakness more or less. Yeah, but again, weakness is only a description. The question to decide is, is that a weakness as a result of a chosen premise or a weakness innate, inborn in him by nature, which he did not choose? Mm -hmm. Othello is presented as jealous and we're never told why he's jealous. All right, now, in conjunction with with the point of tragedy, and very kind of close point, is the one we touch upon, and that is the creation of negatives. Why the creation of only negative is a, a, a flaw, literally and philosophically. The best example of it will be the Stoyevsky, of course, whom we cited. Uh, here is a man who is a moralist, but a moralist on the wrong uh, code of values, who was never able successfully to project uh, the positive side of what he really considered the good or what he stood for. He certainly attempted it in several novels very unsuccessfully. But on presenting the evil he denounced, he was a master. And that is in effect a flaw in his novels. There is a certain kind of way incomplete work of fiction. There are marvelous studies. I, for instance, like to read them as the spectacle of human intelligence and perceptions at work. That is, the spectacle of Dostoevsky's mind, what it's able to identify and to present. But after you finish this, you only have the satisfaction of having learned something about human nature, not the artistic satisfaction of having uh, lived through an experience which is an end in itself. It's anything but an end in itself, and nobody would want to live through any of those experiences.
therefore the purpose there is more didactic than artistic. Uh, yet the art means are superlative. Uh, his technique is magnificent. But uh, since art primarily is a presentation of values, then from that basic definition, Dostoevsky fails because he can only project his values in, by means of negative. We know what he's against. We don't know what he's for. He's not able to do it. And uh, uh, he, uh, the reason he can't, of course, is because he's much too intelligent a man and too good an artist to uh, be successfully uh, able to project a Christian ideal. That's what he wanted to, that's what he believed, and he couldn't do it. Now, uh, an example from another uh, field which I wanted to cite uh, just for purpose of clarity is Goya. You know, the, the uh, artist who is a master at presenting unspeakable cause. And there, uh, the, it is also said that, he, uh, and in fact probably true biographically, that his purpose was to denounce the horror of war. And, and uh, you see, you know, horrible things uh, that uh, he painted as uh, illustrations of the Napoleonic Wars in Spain. Now, what I would question about Goya, and in a certain sense even about Dostoevsky, is this. After all, an artist, whether he identifies it or not, is busy projecting and creating his values. And it requires a certain amount of fascination with evil, upholding evil as a value in order to be able to devote a whole work exclusively to that. Dostoevsky very openly projected that. Uh, and in some of uh, his personal notes, or what's known about his biography, his tragedy was that he, wa with all his Christian morality, he was fascinated by evil. Since art is selective, and since all projections of art, whether the artist knows it or not, are the projection of his view of life that which he considers significant or important about life, that which he values, then we, the romantic school, will win over the naturalist, hands down, in logic, if, step by step, we can assume a rational naturalist now, uh, if we can prove to them what is the nature of art, then the romanticist is the greater artist than the natural is because he succeeds better at that which is the primary, the logical purpose of art, namely to create that which should be morally desirable, things as they might be and ought to be. And it's in that sense, when you read a work of fiction, you do read it for the purpose of leaving that experience. When they accuse uh, plot writers or popular literature of being escape literature. That is a term which I would accept very proudly uh, because the question there is only what they mean by the word escape. Psychologically, uh, it would be improper if literature were only a substitute, an escape from actual reality. But when it's a literature which projects that which is better than actual reality, but possible, then it fulfills the proper function of morality, and that is to set up goals and ideals which men should and can achieve. And in that sense, if it's escape, in the sense of conflict uh, with or better than at present existing reality, then the term escape literature is a high compliment. Uh, people do read books and do go to plays or movies because they want a certain kind of vicarious experience. Uh, and that is proper if that experience is of a kind which does apply to their own lives and does present and dramatize their own values. It is worthless only uh, when uh, it is escape for escape's sake or fantasy for fantasy's sake, when it is inapplicable to anything that can be serious or real in human life. When, however, it's an improvement on the journalistically existing reality, then that is the highest form of art. Now, I personally always read a book 
for one purpose only, and with one viewpoint, and no amount of literary skill, nothing will stand in my eyes uh, of equal importance, nor will redeem the work for me. I read a book only for the purpose of seeing the kind of people I would want to see in real life, or living the kind of experience I would want to live. That is why I like only plus novels, and only novels about important or interesting people. And if you ask me, are there many that I can enjoy uh, on those terms, I would say no, them few, and then only partially, but that is my standard. And my answer to those who would say, uh, is that a limited uh, use of, uh, of fiction, would be no, because for any other purpose than that, nonfiction is better. If it's for the purpose of learning something, uh, then I can learn it from nonfiction. But in the one realm where concretization is necessary and where nonfiction cannot do it as well, that is the realm of values and the concretization of those values in human reality, nothing can take the place of art and specifically fiction. And since that is the primary purpose, that is what I personally enjoy most and the only thing that counts. I would not want to live through a Dostoevsky story. Now that is a writer whom I admire very much, but only technically, only literarily. I can't say that I enjoy reading his stories. I can enjoy Hugo, even if I don't share his ideas and don't always approve of his tragic ending. Nevertheless, of any literature existing, that is the man nearest to creating the kind of people and events that you would like to see or observe or live with. Now, that is my personal uh, enjoyment of literature and one which is not subjective. And when I say personal, I only mean mine. I mean that I could defend and prove it in every respect and these lectures are part of the proof. Now, in conclusion, I'll tell you this. Uh, now that we're finishing the theoretical course, I'd like to quote something that Disraeli said was, and then paraphrase. You know, Disraeli was supposed to be a fiction writer, too. Uh, and somebody asked him once, why was he writing? No. And uh, he said, because he wanted to have something good to read. <laughs> now, I'll, I have something good to read. But I'll paraphrase it this way, that my purpose in this series of actions, of, of lectures, is that in the next few years I will have something good for you. And now it's up to you.